Gabby. <clears throat> okay, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to begin our New Aces County City of Corpus Christi press briefing on COVID-19. Today is Monday, the 20th of July. I'll be presenting first, and um, we do have with us Annette Rodriguez, our public health director. She'll say a few words this afternoon, as well as New Aces County Judge Barbara Canales and then Mayor Joe McComb. I'm not sure of the exact order. Uh, people are here. We're trying to get them into our chambers here, so we'll kind of play it by ear. But um, after I present some of the statistics, we did want to show you a short video uh, that um, somebody I met when we were touring the Corpus Christi Army Depot, a gentleman by the name of Rod Benson. He's the chief operations officer at CCAD Army Depot. And uh, he, like many other folks, have sent encouraging words uh, to me to be passed on to the community. And uh, he sent me a video over the weekend that I thought would be good uh, to show the community through our forum today. Forum today, And um, it just it reminds us of what COVID is and how it's so destructive to the body and, and uh, how it's passed along and why things like a face mask and social distancing and keeping your hands clean can make a big difference on reducing the spread. So we're gonna show that after I present, and then we'll have uh, one of our other presenters uh, come up to the podium. Okay, so uh, we wanna thank those that are watching. We know this is covered uh, live by our networks, and uh, we know people are watching it on Facebook and YouTube. We know we have radio listeners and our public uh, radio uh, sh a show that's broadcast around the Coastal Bend. So we appreciate people watching and listening we want you to use this information and we just have to be vigilant and continue to share it with others and maybe help those that don't know any better uh, to uh, give them tips along the way. Um, the only way we're going to reduce the spread is by education and, and good practice, good practices that our health professionals continue to remind us. So this information is important for you, but it's important to pass it along to, to, your, to people that you know. Okay, so with that, let's begin with the daily statistics for our number of new cases. So today we're reporting 237 new COVID-19 positives for our county, for Nueces County. This is uh, some of the good news is it's less than Saturday. Actually, it's more than Saturday, just by one. And um, if we go back to last Monday, July 13, right here, it's, um, it's, six uh six fewer than july a little bit more than six fewer than july 13. or six percent i mean i'm sorry six percent less so here's this monday last monday so we're about six percent less than a week ago monday which is good but we still know it's not a zero and it's not a three and it's not a five it's 200 still unacceptably too high uh, but um, on the other side, it's less than our spike numbers of 600 and 500 that we saw just a couple of days ago on Tuesday and Wednesday, respectively. The 237 is less than our seven-day average, which is now ranging at 341, so less than that seven-day average as well. And when we look at the total number of cases, active cases compared to recovered about 13% or a little over 1,100 persons have recovered since we've been tracking this back in, in March. But we do have 87% of all the cases are active or about 7,600 or so, 589 active cases. And this number right here is that yellow slice, the number of deaths is, is at 103. We'll go over that momentarily. When we look at the hospitalizations, we're three fewer in the hospital today than yesterday. So a total of 380 that are in the hospital recovering. And yesterday, Sunday, there was 383. Of those recovering in the hospital, 16, 116 are in ICU, an intensive care unit. And that is also six less, uh, or it's, it's fewer than yesterday. So six fewer than yesterday. Yesterday we had 122, so today 116. And then our number of deaths is at over the 100 mark now. We were at 95 yesterday, and today we're announcing eight new deaths. So at 103, you can see on our graph there, 
most of these deaths took place over the last couple of weeks in July. And then this looks pretty promising. This is our running average uh, or running total of daily cases plus kind of the trend line, looking at a seven-day average. And you can see it's, it's beginning to come down a little bit. We hope this will continue. We'll see uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, I think will be some telltale signs. Uh, Seven-day average, as I mentioned, is 341 new cases every day. And that average is, does take into consideration these big five and 600 numbers. So when they drop off, if our cases stay low, then our seven-day average should drop pretty, pretty significantly tomorrow, uh, hoping that these numbers stay low down here. You can see the seven-day average trend lines beginning to come down, and uh, we hope that that'll continue that way. We did, the city, county, uh, public health district did do a drive-through testing operation today, about 130 people or so tested. We have enough supplies to continue our testing through Thursday. And uh, at our labs, we get results the same day. And so uh, the military and other folks, sometimes uh, the, uh, the uh, National Guard and, and others ship theirs out of, this, out of the region. So it, takes, it can take several weeks, really. And so our, our tests are a good indicator of what's out there because when we take the tests, we analyze them in the lab that same day. And that's what we did today. We'll be doing the same thing tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday. So I think that'll be a good indicator of our caseload. And we can see if our trend is indeed uh, beginning to go the other way, which we really need it to, to uh, do. Okay, so uh, Gabby's going to translate that into, into Spanish. And then we'll take a quick second, and then we're going to put this video up. We want people to watch it. I did post it on Facebook over the weekend. So... Uh, if you want to share it with some of your friends or your own Facebook sites, it'd be great. It's a good, uh, simple to watch video, uh, but it does show us <clears throat> how dangerous the virus is and why it's, uh, it's uh, obtained by people and what we have to do to not get it. All right. Thank you. En las últimas 24 horas se han reportado 237 casos confirmados por el coronavirus, haciendo un total de 8,816 casos. 1,124 pacientes se han recuperado por completo, 380 personas continúan en el hospital, 116 están en la unidad de cuidados intensivos, 7,589 casos continúan aún activos. El día de hoy se reportan 8, 8 fallecimientos, a la fecha los fallecimientos totalizan 103 personas. Vamos a continuar realizando pruebas hasta el día jueves antes de agotar nuestros recursos. Man, these times we're living in are crazy. Remember when the Rona first hit and people were fighting over toilet paper? Or in the house with nothing to do but hang out with friends online? Or watch another streaming show that you can't believe you're watching, but you're still watching? Then things erupted across the world after the police killing of George Floyd. Then states started opening their doors for business as if the Rona just disappeared. But guess what? The Rona is still here. This is what it looks like, and we're kind of going to show you how this thing works. Look at this woman in the grocery store. She ain't wearing a mask, and then this dude without a mask invades her body bubble, talking way too close. He has the Rona, and she's about to get it. It works kind of like this. The Rona usually slides in through the nose, mouth, or the eyes. It goes to the throat and lungs, where there's a whole bunch of cells that line the walls of our respiratory system. This is where the Rona sets up shop, turning these cells into a virus factory. You see, healthy cells have machinery to reproduce themselves. But when the Rona comes through, it punks the cell into using this machine to make more viruses. It makes so many that it gets bloated and dies. When that cell dies, all those viruses are released into the body to repeat this savage process on other healthy cells. This happens over and over, leaving a whole lot of dead cells and Rona viruses in our lungs. The Rona is putting in work, but at this point, we're still hanging out and kicking it because there are no symptoms yet. For the Rona, this is just the incubation period. It takes anywhere from 2 to 14 days after the virus is set up shop for symptoms to show. It's usually a sore throat to start because that's where the virus first camps out. Now, by this time, your body may be recognizing that something ain't right and it starts to fight a little bit. Viruses don't like heat, so your body raises the temperature. That's your fever. 
The coughing and sneezing is your body trying to dislodge the virus and kick it out. At this stage, the rona is in a groove, infecting all the healthy cells it can find. But as these cells are dying, they send a message to the immune system. Dude, we are catching a beat down. Somebody send some help, please. Now the immune system kicks in the gear and they're ready to fight. They come in and start blowing stuff up, trying to kill the infected cells because they're the ones making all the viruses. The problem is they're not just killing the infected cells. They're killing the healthy ones too. More lung cells are dying. This triggers a storm of immune cells that show up and wreak havoc, causing more damage. Now there are all these dead cells floating around in your lungs, making it hard to breathe. The battle causes inflammation, and that's painful. As bad as this sounds, roughly 8 out of 10 people will survive this stage and be fine. The immune system gets their act together, wins the war, and recovery begins. In severe cases, though, the immune system can't figure it out, and the lungs are all messed up from the fight. Now a ventilator is needed to do what the lungs can't do anymore. With the lungs all jacked up, Oxygen flow to other organs ain't really happening, and the body begins to shut down. I know this sounds pretty bad, and it is, but it doesn't have to be. If you've been out touching all sorts of stuff, don't touch your face until you've washed your hands. Rona doesn't like soap and water. If you have to be out, wear something over your face, a mask or a bandana. It ain't foolproof, but it's better than being face naked. If you're sick but don't know it, wearing a mask makes it harder for you to spread the Rona. If you're not sick and you're talking to someone who is, especially that someone who speaks with those strong C's, T's, and P's, your mask will help protect you from the Rona-filled spit droplets. Keep distance between you and other people with that six-foot radius body bubble. And if you don't need groceries and it's not an emergency, stay your ass at home. Good afternoon, that was a great video. So, Annette Rodriguez, Public Health Director. So, um, like City Manager Zanoni mentioned, we did have our drive-through today at the Health Department. We had 150 uh, that went through. We invited 300 and 150 showed up. 47 positives out of the 150, which is a um, percent of about 31% that are still testing positive in our drive-throughs. El día de hoy se llevó a cabo la toma de especímenes móvil. Fue un total de 150 pruebas, las cuales 47 resultaron positivas al coronavirus, o sea, el 31% de estas. So the announcement of the number of babies that we have seen here in Nueces County that have tested positive for COVID-19 have brought up a lot of additional questions. So we're going to do a question and answer um, so we can get some of those questions answered. En cuanto al anuncio del número de bebés que hemos visto aquí en el condado de Nueces que han dado positivo al COVID-19, ha generado muchas preguntas adicionales. Vamos a tratar de contestar algunas de esas preguntas. So the first question is, how old were these 85 babies that tested positive here in Nueces County? The answer is, these babies were all one year of age or younger. Their age ranges from one day up to 23 months of age. Some could have been 13 months old or 18 months old, but none of these babies have turned two yet. ¿Qué edad tenían estos 85 bebés que dieron positivo en el condado de Nueces? La respuesta es, todos los bebés tenían un año de edad o menos. Sus edades varían desde un día hasta 23 meses de edad. Algunos podrían tener 13 meses o 18 meses, pero ninguno de estos bebés ha cumplido dos años todavía. Were all 85 COVID-19 positive babies from the same place, from the same daycare, from the same church setting, et cetera? The answer is no. These babies all tested at different times from different locations. Many get tested as part of the intake process at the hospital, while others may get tested at their pediatrician's office. Fueron los 85 bebés positivos para COVID-19 del mismo lugar, como una guardería o la iglesia? No, a los bebés se les realizó la prueba en diferentes momentos y en diferentes lugares. Muchos se hacen la prueba como parte del proceso de admisión en el hospital, mientras que otros pueden hacerse la prueba en el consultorio de su pediatra. Did all 85 babies test positive recently? The answer is no. Approximately 60 babies, one year of age and younger, tested positive this 
month from July 1st to July 16th. The other approximate 25 babies, one year and younger, tested positive between March 21st and June 30th. Los 85 bebés dieron positivo recientemente. No, aproximadamente 60 bebés de un año de edad y menores dieron positivo este mes, entre el 1 de julio y el 16 de julio. Los otros, aproximadamente 25 bebés de un año o menos, dieron positivo entre el 21 de marzo y el 30 de junio. Why did these babies get tested? Great question. Many got tested because parents took their baby to the hospital for whatever the reason, not always due to COVID-19 virus. Many of them were tested as part of the hospital's COVID plan. My understanding is that the patients that go to the children's hospital are tested for COVID-19 as a precautionary measure to the healthcare workers. Others we talked to told us their baby was exposed to someone with COVID-19, usually a family member that recently tested positive and that is why they tested their baby. ¿Por qué se hicieron pruebas a estos bebés? Muchos se hicieron la prueba porque los padres llevaban a su bebé al hospital por cualquiera que haya sido la razón y no necesariamente debido al virus. A muchos de ellos se les realizó la prueba como parte del plan COVID del hospital. Tengo entendido que todos los pacientes que van al hospital infantil son examinados para detectar el COVID-19 como medida de precaución para los trabajadores de salud. Otros con los que hablamos nos dijeron que su bebé había estado expuesto a alguien con COVID-19, generalmente un miembro de familia que recientemente dio positivo y por eso evaluaron a su bebé. Next question. Who does the COVID-19 test for these babies? The answer is some test at the hospital, as mentioned earlier. Others were tested at their pediatrician's office and still others are being tested in various urgent care clinics. And we even see some of these babies coming through our drive through at the health district. ¿Quién realiza la prueba COVID-19 para estos bebés? Algunas pruebas en el hospital, otros fueron evaluados con sus pediatras y otros en varias clínicas de atención de urgencia. E incluso estamos viendo algunos que están llegando a través de nuestra unidad. When babies get sick, do the public health officials see them get really sick? Two things to remember about that question. First, public health officials receive the positive COVID-19 laboratory test. We are not these babies doctors. Our job is to call the contact person for the baby and talk to them about the proper isolation precautions. We do not provide direct patient care to any of these babies. Their care comes from their pediatrician, their hospital physician, or sometimes a neonatologist, depending on the level of care required. Second, public health's job is early detection and isolation to keep the virus from transmitting to others. We can say that many of the parents of these babies have told us that the babies are not that sick. They seem to experience the symptoms of congestion, a low-grade fever, and some have diarrhea as well. Most of these babies will recover without incident. Cuando estos bebés se enferman, ¿los funcionarios de salud pública los ven realmente enfermos? Dos cosas para recordar. Los primeros funcionarios de salud pública reciben los resultados positivos del laboratorio COVID-19. No somos los médicos de esos bebés. Nuestro trabajo es llamar a la persona de contacto para ese bebé y hablar con ellos sobre las precauciones de aislamiento adecuadas. No brindamos atención directa al paciente a ninguno de estos bebés. Su atención proviene de su pediatra, médico del hospital o a veces un neonatólogo, según el nivel de atención requerido. Segundo, la responsabilidad del Departamento de Salud Pública es la detección temprana y el aislamiento para evitar que el virus se transmita a otros. Podemos decir que muchos de los padres de estos bebés nos han dicho que el bebé no está tan enfermo. Parecen experimentar síntomas de congestión, fiebre leve y algunos también tienen diarrea. La mayoría de estos bebés se recuperarán sin incidentes. Have any of these babies been hospitalized from the 85 babies? Yes, our records show that nine of these 85 babies have been hospitalized over the course of the four months. Algunos de estos bebés han sido hospitalizados. Sí, nuestros registros muestran que nueve de estos 85 bebés han sido hospitalizados en el transcurso de los últimos cuatro meses. Have any of these babies passed away? Our records show that we have had one baby under the age of six months that has passed away that tested positive for COVID-19. His cause of death was diagnosed as SIDS. Until we hear more from the medical examiner's office and CDC, we will not have a definitive answer. ¿Algunos de estos bebés ha fallecido? Nuestros registros muestran que hemos tenido un bebé menor de seis meses que falleció. 
Él resultó positivo por COVID-19. Su causa de muerte fue diagnosticada como síndrome de muerte súbita, hasta que contemos con el resultado de la autopsia que llevará a cabo el médico forense, así como por parte del Centro para el Control de Enfermedades. How do you properly care for a baby that is positive for COVID-19? The same way you would care for any other sick baby, except you limit their exposure to others. We ask that the caretaker and the baby isolate themselves in a bedroom with their own restroom. Other family members can be helpful by bringing food, snacks, drinks, diapers, and other necessities and placing them outside the closed door. They can knock, walk away, and mama can wait a few minutes and then open the door to retrieve these items. The more the baby can be isolated from other family members during the incubation period, the better the chance that siblings and others will not get the virus. ¿Cómo se debe cuidar adecuadamente a un bebé que dio positivo para COVID-19? De la misma manera que cuidaría a cualquier otro bebé enfermo, excepto que limite su exposición a otros. Pedimos que la persona que cuida al bebé se aíslen en una habitación con su propio baño. Otros miembros de la familia pueden ser útiles trayendo comida, bebidas, pañales y otras necesidades y colocándolos afuera de la puerta cerrada. Pueden llamar, alejarse y mamá puede esperar unos minutos y luego abrir la puerta para recuperar esos artículos. Cuanto más se pueda aislar al bebé de otros miembros de la familia durante el periodo de aislamiento, mayores serán las posibilidades de que los hermanos y otras personas no contraigan el virus. What can we do to keep babies from getting this virus? Answer, limit public exposure to your infants. If you can keep, keep them home, you should do so. Always wash your hands frequently when around babies. Babies under the age of two should not ever have a mask on for safety purposes, so keeping them out of public spaces is very important. But if you do have to go out, everyone in the community should be wearing a mask to protect these little ones from getting sick. Remember, these babies are still working on building up their immunity, so they need all of us to do our part to keep them safe. ¿Qué podemos hacer para evitar que los bebés contraigan este virus? Limite la exposición pública a sus bebés. Si puede mantenerlos en casa, debe hacerlo. Siempre lávese las manos con frecuencia cuando esté cerca de bebés. Los bebés menores de dos años nunca deben usar un cubrebocas por razones de seguridad, por lo que es muy importante mantenerlos fuera de los espacios públicos. Pero si tiene que salir, utilice un cubrebocas para ayudar a proteger a los niños de enfermarse. Recuerde que estos bebés aún están desarrollando su sistema inmune, por lo que necesitan que todos hagamos nuestra parte para mantenerlos seguros. Public health prevention strategies when you are dealing with an infant that's COVID-19 positive. Physically distance yourself from babies. Everybody loves a baby and wants to go up to it and see how cute it is and, you know, uh, love on the baby. This is not the time to do any of those things. Everyone needs to wear a mask to protect our babies in our community. Wash your hands frequently for at least 20 seconds. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands because if you get sick, you can get others sick. Avoid being near sick people, especially with your baby. Physically distance yourself from others in case somebody sneezes and your baby's unprotected. Disinfect frequently touched surfaces so everything's as clean as possible. If you are sick, stay home and don't drop off your sick baby at a daycare. Estrategias de prevención de salud pública cuando tiene bebés. Distanciarse físicamente de los bebés. Utilizar un cubrebocas. Lavarse las manos con frecuencia. Evite tocarse los ojos, la nariz y la boca con las manos sin lavar. Evite estar cerca de personas enfermas. Distan distanciarse físicamente desde los demás. Desinfecte las superficies frecuentemente tocadas. Y si está enfermo, quédese en casa. No lleve a un bebé enfermo a una guardería. Please accept our condolences to the families of the eight deceased um, individuals today. And everybody stay well, stay social distance, and as always, stay informed. Thank you. Nuestro más sentido pésame para las ocho personas quienes fallecieron el día de hoy y para todos sus amigos.
so much for, for cleaning up for me. Good afternoon. Barbara Canales, Noises County Judge. I'm going to make some remarks, and I think it's perfect timing after that great Q&A uh, from Director Rodriguez. My comments will also touch a little bit about some of the things that she talked about, but then I will also um, uh, try to highlight some of the other uh, topics of our day. Uh, I guess it would be remiss of me if I did not share with you that like Director Rodriguez, all weekend we spent a lot of time uh, responding to the interest uh, from the public and the media in Nueces County. And it's very good to get information out. It's, it's a very important part of our process. And you learn a lot. You learn about where there are strengths and where there are weaknesses in giving you that information. So let me state this up front. We are a big team here, and we are committed to all the transparency in government that is required and also that we require of ourselves in response to this pandemic. I believe that information is power, and I believe that information can give us insight and informs our decision making. And so I know that Mayor McComb and Manager Zanoni and uh, Public Health Director um, Rodriguez share my commitment to this type of information and transparency. They are consistent um, at the same time with the rights of individual patients to privacy. And so we're always working hard to present the public with what we know as soon as we know it. So um, I want to make sure that data has context. And so we gave a lot of interviews this weekend and even today about context for data so that you can understand it and so that we can continue to bring it to you. And that's why we have these news briefings and why we're here to answer these questions. And so as, as she's already gone um, into very good detail, I won't belabor it, but we talked about the uh, figure of the 85 infants. And this is a factual number, very important to highlight all that q and I'm going to try to do a synopsis. That's a factual number. 85 is a total cumulative number. And it's presented in the context of a larger discussion which is the coronavirus pandemic and how serious it is. And it makes sense to cite this statistics. It illustrates that no one is naturally immune to the virus. While the elderly and those with existing medical conditions are at greater risk of illness and death, anyone can get the virus. All of you young people, anyone can get the virus from elderly to infants and without regard for race or gender or economic status. And we try to emphasize this, but nothing emphasized it more than Friday afternoon. That's really why we're talking about it so much is because here we've been having all of these briefings every day, but isn't it fascinating that this data point really hurt us? It struck us. It gets to the guts and the core of what it means to be human and to hear something so horrific and so terrible is that 85 children have contracted this disease since we started counting. And so that's why that number is so important. It's to illustrate that point. And sometimes points like that take a life of its own. And, and so, um, you know, there were a lot of misinformation, but I think that you've heard very well that um, all of the different um, details that were presented in the Q&A that, um, of course, the number was under the age of two. And, and that's because we talk about um, babies between the ages of one and two in terms of months. But it caused confusion thinking that people had to be, uh, that all 85 are maybe under 12 months. And so we've made these corrections today for clarification. Without context, this number during our press conference last week may believe uh, may lead people to believe it's some sudden surge from one data point, and this was not the case. But it does tell us something. It tells us that uh, this is about 1% of our 8,500 cases. It also tells us that 85 is bigger than zero. And so it's an important point to make. And some people only believe that the elderly uh, or the immune compromise are really being affected. And this virus does not discriminate and no one is immune. So I think it's very important to repeat that the first three and a half months, March, April, May, and June, we had in context 25 children diagnosed. 
So when you look at that whole stretch of time, it doesn't seem like there is a trend. It just seems that those are data points within all of that time period. But if you take July 1 to July 16th, we had 60 children in that age range test positive. And so being able to sort through that data is um, very important. And so I believe that by noticing that data and sharing with you and me and the rest of the public that data is so critical and vital because at seven days, you're not sure if it means anything. But at 14 days, you know that it does. That's what we call a real trend. And that's what science is all about. It's not about one data point. It's not about two. It's about looking at the whole context. And so I want to say thank you for noticing it, for sharing it with us. And I want to commend her for it. And so the most important thing is you might be saying, well, why didn't we see it earlier? Okay. And I want to give you the best explanation. And as a very famous American said, and it has the added value of being true. Do you remember in the early days of the pandemic, we would be up here, we would tell you about one single case. We would literally go into the best detail because we had all the information to share. And we could tell you where this person traveled to, we could tell you where they had been, if it came from their home, their work, their school, their job. We had so much information, you could just pinpoint it with a little dot. We don't have that type of situation anymore. And that's what this virus has done to us. And it's spread in our community. Our positive tests have resulted. Community spread has become um, something that has created a situation where we're, all we can say is that they, people contracting this just lived life. They just went to the grocery store or they just went to the drugstore and they found this virus and it came to them and they became infected. And so our daily cases went from single digits till June 22nd when things changed and we went 100 positive cases. And we've never seen 100 since. Since June 22nd, we have not seen 100 since. And so the sources um, of these cases are coming from multiple labs, multiple types of testing. Not all of them collect the same data. And we barely have enough opportunity to get the positives notified. That's the primary job. That's what she's talking about when she says we have to isolate. That is our main job. Test, diagnose, and isolate. And that should give you an idea, if we're using reverse alert, how inundated we are at this moment. And this isn't just here at the health department. It's in our hospitals, hospital beds, ICUs. Everything is being affected by this cumulative wave of cases. And so what I want to tell you is that we are going to employ data management and analytics to try to get a hold of what it is that's happening to us. And we're going to ramp up a, hopefully, a, a type of dashboard that is more informative for all of you at home. And I hope to be able to bring this to you in the coming weeks, but it doesn't come because we just aren't doing it right. It comes because we're having to set up new information systems to be able to handle this type of volume and be able to decipher all of the data that used to be easy when it was just here on our hands. Now the volume is so large and I want you to make sure you understand that. Finally, I had an opportunity to visit with TEDM this afternoon. That's your Texas Department of Emergency Management. And I'm happy to say that from uh, July 27th through August the 2nd, we're gonna be using a new testing company called Davila and they are gonna be testing at the fairgrounds and we're gonna be doing mass testing. And I'm going to hopefully get this good new integrative technology to be able to make it easy to sign up. We'll bring you more information, but mark your calendars. That's going to be wonderful when you have a friend that says, I need to get tested between July 27th and August 2nd. We're going to be able to do it every day. We're going to be able to do massive amounts of people, which is wonderful because it will alleviate some of the burden on our health department. And this is courtesy of the state of Texas and Texas Department of Emergency Management. And we were able to confirm that just a moment ago. So 
As always, we're fighting for you, for this community, and reducing the spread of this virus. I get asked constantly, how are you doing? Sometimes I don't feel so good. Sometimes I'm mad and angry and frustrated, just like all of you. But you know what? Today, I am really happy to say I feel strong. I feel courageous. I feel like fighting. I feel like getting everything that we need this week. And so I don't want you to worry about your team. Your team is here for the long haul. And I'm no longer worried about, you know, when we're going to get what we need. We will get what we need to battle this virus. So from clinics to testing to data to dashboards, we're going to make sure that you get the information that you need so you can make sense of some of it. But don't lose sight of the big picture ever. It's terrible that all these little children have been diagnosed with coronavirus. It's not a good thing. But once you understand it in context, you can understand why it's so important to reduce the transmission. Because in two weeks, we've had 60 cases. We have to understand that means something. And we also have to understand it in context that if it reverses, then we've done a good thing. So understanding the data, putting it in context, and making sense of it is where we're headed. And I look forward to answering any further questions if needed. Thanks. El fin de semana estuvimos ocupados contestando muchas preguntas sobre los bebés infectados con el virus. La información es muy importante y nos basamos en ella para tomar las decisiones. Es importante informarle que la cifra de los 85 bebés es precisa. Ha habido mala información en el público, pero las preguntas y respuestas que acaba de dar la directora es veraz. La cifra de 85 bebés no ocurrió de un día para otro. Mucha gente cree que solo los ancianos o personas con sistemas inmunes débiles se ven afectados. En los últimos 15 días, más de 60 bebés fueron diagnosticados, el resto durante los tres primeros meses y medio desde el mes de marzo. Si se pregunta por qué no dimos, es, a, dimos a conocer esa información anteriormente, primero estábamos buscando detalles sobre cada caso. El virus está en nuestra comunidad, la propagación está en todos lados. Nuestros casos diarios fueron desde un solo dígito hasta los tres dígitos. Nuestra información proviene de diversos lugares, desde laboratorios privados, hospitales y muchos otros lados. Vamos a emplear un analista y vamos a poder determinar más información y obtener así más respuestas y poder así contabilizar toda nuestra información. Asimismo, en cuanto a las pruebas, vamos a utilizar otro tipo de análisis de pruebas para así facilitar el tiempo de pruebas y hacerlas diariamente y en grandes números, gracias al apoyo del Estado. Vamos a hacer lo posible de traerle toda la información lo mejor posible, ya que es importante que evitemos la propagación, especialmente de, al ver estas cifras tan altas en los bebés. Good afternoon. I'll be brief. The judge gave a lot of information, and so did Peter. But one of the things that I wanted to share with you is that uh, last week we announced that we would be uh, having a, a thank you gift to the people to, that came by the different centers to help them uh, continue our fight with COVID. In other words, we're providing masks, some hand sanitizers, and some wipes. Uh, that was extremely successful today. It was scheduled for today at the four centers, the Coastal Bend Wellness Foundation, the Women's and Men's Health Services of the Coastal Bend, Mission of Mercy Medical Center, and Amistad Community Health Center. Uh, it was very successful, and the result of that, uh, we gave approximately 2,000 of those packages out. Uh, people were very appreciative. Uh, most of the people came by, had a mask. Uh, but there were a few that didn't, and so we told them, we got a mask in there, make sure you get it on. Oh, yes, sir. And so we've gotten people's attention, and we want to thank the community for their response and their commitment to doing this, and I think you'll see as the numbers in the next few days continue. Uh, hopefully, they'll be going down. Uh, tomorrow's Tuesday. We'll probably get a uh, report from those uh, tests that were done over the weekend on outside labs, and hopefully they'll, uh, they won't be... Uh, eye shattering when we get them but uh, I believe we're doing the right things uh, we can't give up uh, we got to stay strong and so that's what we're going to do but uh, I wanted to give you an update that uh, the project this morning was very successful and I appreciate those four organizations participating in that all of that was done by volunteer 
labor and putting those things and get, getting in the bags, getting them separated and sorted and, and handed out. So thank you to them and the Coastal Bend Community Foundation for their effort uh, in doing this. And uh, we'll see, hopefully it will show some positive results in terms of the uh, continuing uh, participation by the public to uh, cut the exposure opportunities uh, by wearing a mask. And let me encourage all of you that haven't been wearing your ears, uh, continue to do it. I think you're seeing some positive results as, a, uh, as the benefit of wearing those masks. So thank you very much. We'll try to get you out of here, or at least to the question and answer period uh, shortly. Anunciamos la semana pasada que entregaríamos unos obsequios para las personas que se realizó la prueba el día de hoy. Más de 2,000 paquetes con geles antibacteriales, toallitas y cubrebocas fueron entregados gracias a nuestra fundación. Esto lo hicimos para ayudar a nuestra comunidad. Creo que estamos haciendo lo correcto y esperamos pronto salir de esta emergencia. Le quiero agradecer a la fundación y sobre todo al público por hacer de su parte. Le pido que lo continúe haciendo. Okay, that concludes our prepared remarks for today. We'll see if there's any questions in the media. Have we, okay. Annette, okay. The, Annette or the uh, mayor or the judge? You have any other ones? Just for the judge? Okay, just give us a sec. Last week, when you issued an order to the for the public schools, yeah, uh, to remain closed, yes, to in person, is there a plan to issue an order for the charter schools? So the charter schools, we were just looking for a little bit more guidance because I think if they fall under the TEA umbrella, it's not a problem. And we were actually, uh, Peter, we were looking into that, and I think that uh, the answer is is that I think it it makes sense, and they didn't seem to be opposed to that. So I think that's probably going to be the right answer, is that if they fall under the umbrella of TEA, then the local health authority's direction would be applicable. If they don't, well, then it wouldn't. Uh, and with this test site that you announced, do you have an idea of how many people would be able to be tested there? Yeah, so I, it's funny you do that. So I was outside, and I was trying to figure out how many people did we test in Robstown on July 11th. It was 584. That's a lot of, in my opinion, that's a big test site. So I think we can do approximately 600 a day, which I think is a great number. And um, so I'm excited about having that ability. And um, again, you know, we've always been a little nervous about using different groups because different groups mean different, in, you know, different information that you have to collect. But I have been told with this particular group, they are kind of the phasing in um, of the new group that the state has brought in. Um, you recall that we did National Guard. So those are going to be going away, and this is the new group coming in. And here's what the other thing is interesting. This is an oral test, Annette. This is a saliva test. So it will not be a swab uh, in your nose. Uh, it will be um, you open your mouth and you take this test. And I understand that they're getting tests back uh, for this particular test within 36 to 48 hours. So now, as they say, let's try it. We haven't tried it yet, but this is all, this is the kind of news I wanna see. Remember what Annette said, our main goal is to diagnose and isolate. If you wanna know what you can do, wear masks, social distance, wash your hands. But if you wanna know what we do every day, it's get you a test, get it, make sure it's free if we can do that, which we have been doing since March. And we make sure that we can give you the right advice to isolate and educate you. 
And now we're going to take it one step forward, which is hopefully get you a clinic where if you're not needing hospitalization, but you need some care, we can provide that too. Okay, I think that uh, concludes our briefing for today, right? Any other questions in the media? Oh, oh, no? Okay, good. All right, then that concludes our briefing for today. We'll be back tomorrow at 5 o'clock. We'll see you then. Thank you.